We're bouncing in our chairs. We're so professional here. It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome back to your favorite wine edutainment podcast. This is episode 193. In this episode, we are grape gabbing about Cabernet Franc and be sure to stay till the end because we're doing a pod quiz and a monthly Patreon drawing. And we do apologize since the Cab Franc episode is a bit late. December 4th was hashtag Cab Franc day. And, uh, you know, here, here we are just doing it at our own leisure. And we're okay with that, right? Because next year will be Cab Franc Day. And that's when we just like recycle this episode. <laughs> you know what, Steph? I'm not going to apologize because I don't <laughs> let a calendar tell me what to drink when. So you can have National Wine Day every day. I don't want to confuse right. anybody. And we can have Cab Franc Day any day we want. So I understand the marketing concept, but... We'll drink Cap Franc whenever we damn well please. And we'll drink Sauv- Sauvignon Blanc in the winter, too. <laughs> damn right. So yes. it is winter, Steph. And what is in your glass this fine December day in Colorado? Well, I'm double fisting again. And what's really <laughs> cool is they're both actually Cab Franc. So uh, I'm proud of myself for that. But one of them is from France. And I'm kind of going a little bit crazy about this wine. It's the 2014 Chateau de Ribonbon. And it's a Bordeaux Superior. And and it's 85% Cab Franc. Okay, so it's not 100%. There is 15% Merlot in there. But this is a buy a case of this wine. Oh, yeah? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, two thumbs up. But, you know, just go ahead and get a whole case. It's so good. At first, when I opened it, immediately it was kind of like bacon and cranberry. Girl. Right? And then once it starts to open up, you start to get those perfumed. It's like like that really awesome like French soap that has like la- um, like lavender, lilac, kind of some of those really mm-hmm. pretty flowers. So it's it definitely developing super in wine. And then the other one is a great example of a Sonoma, California Cabernet Franc. And that is from 2012, a little bit older um, and also very good. I had this like image of like energetic Elvis dancing as I was tasting this wine. Is that not hilarious? Like seriously, I was like velvet Elvis and there's a lot of energy in the wine and it's darker in color um, and more concentrated and kind of just more colorful in that personality type. Blueberries, blackberries, things like that, but also a very cool wine. And then with some time, it started to open up and has much more of a spiciness to it. And this is a combination of 96% Cab Franc and then 4% Cabernet Sauvignon. So very, very different examples, but also very good. And uh, I'm like, oh, I think I'll pour a little bit more since we were pre-gaming and I was sort of (laughs) sip, sip, sip. I do have two wines in my glass. So you got a 12, a 14. I'm drinking a 16 Domaine Dozon Chinon Rosé by Eric Sanchier. And this is from the Loire Valley and it is Cabernet Franc. But as I was digging in my cellar today and I was kind of going up and down stairs, I realized I had a bottle of Cabernet Franc in my cellar that I totally forgot about. And I sent Steph a, a picture and said, I am an idiot because this is a Grand River Vineyards and it was a 2008. And I had to open it. I had to see what was going on there because you know I know Cabernet Francs can age they've got tannin right they've got acid they've got those things that preserve the wine but I'm like well I don't know you know when I was there in 2013 it was fine yeah so I bought this wine five years ago when it was five years old and then I thought well this is a 10 year old wine now and I opened it and Steph's like is it still good and I was like well first I thought no and then I kept it in my glass and I would keep swirling it and sniffing it and then I would do a taste and I thought we got on the podcast I said Steph I'm not hating it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing foul. There's nothing funky in this wine. And I think what it does do, even though I kind of missed the window on drinking this wine, first of all, you know, 
I mean it as a compliment to say that the, a 10 year old Colorado Cab Franc is not the worst thing you can open <laughs> because well because some wines just don't you know don't age well but I have to say I said I, it's interesting enough that I poured a little more on my glass and I started playing with it some more so it's held my interest yeah and I think it does testify to the longevity of Cab Franc even though I probably missed the window on this one just maybe by a year or two perhaps but I think it, it does have you know it's a lot of tertiary a lot of dried fruit but there's nothing funky nothing foul maybe a little bit of aroma balsamic but it's not vinegar it's not ready for my vinegar jar you could cook with it and you could actually just think about you know where were you in 2008 when this was made and so I'm not hating on it I'm not hating on it and I think it says a lot about the grape that we're going to talk about today Steph yes yes and this is we both love Cab Franc so we experience some joy when we are researching and and uh, doing doing what we do to prepare for this podcast because Cab Franc should have been covered maybe episodes ago but you know now it's getting its time and this this grape is known it's a red grape and it is known really for the famous wine from Chateau Chablon from Saint-Yon and you may have remembered uh, the movie from 2004 the sideways where Miles played by Paul Giamatti he drinks a 1961 Chateau Cheval Blanc at the end of the film right when he's like at that sad fast food joint eating a hamburger and he's like pouring his uh, <laughs> shovel blanc into his like plastic cup but but yeah so some if, for anybody who hasn't really had Cabernet Franc we're going to give you really the 411 on this thing it is a small blue black berry the skins are thinner than Cabernet Sauvignon and therefore they ripen about a week or so earlier the vines are vigorous and not too terribly picky about climate since they bud later there's less of a risk for a late frost killing them off in the spring and since they ripen earlier there's less risk of that early winter frost so it's a total win-win on either side of that growing season but Cabernet Franc is no Goldilocks like Pinot Noir I mean it really is grown all over the world which we're going to get into in various different climates so that's why you're going to see it everywhere as sometimes a blending blending grape it's often you find it with Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot but in comparison to Cabernet Sauvignon Cabernet Franc is lighter in body with less tannin and less acid. It's also lighter in color, but it is more perfumed and expressive with fruitiness and herbaceousness than Cabernet Sauvignon. And the number one thing that if we'd have to underline anything, it is really most known for its greenness, that herbaceousness or green characteristic. I think that makes it really great for wines like the sparkling wines that you can make with it. There's rosé in my glass, which I was supposed to talk about but didn't and I talked about the wine I said I wasn't going to talk about but it does bring that perfume to the wine because the first thing I thought about with the rosé was boy there's that as you were talking you know there's that rose petal or it's almost kind of a dried apricot thing in a red wine so it does bring that aroma that floral that beautiful perfume and it does it reminds me of perfume and I don't even love perfume but I do love a perfumed wine so I think we've talked about Cabernet Franc quite a bit throughout the show because we drink it a lot you loved it you've mentioned it a couple times how you love Cabernet Franc. I've drunk a lot of Chinon and Bourgogne on the show, uh, Le Grand Bouquetto, and all these I, that I've repeated myself drinking. And yeah. we do love the grapes, so I'm glad we're talking about it now. But it has some other names, and I don't think we've actually talked about any of these other names, but what else is this thing called around the, well, right now, the Europe? Yeah. <laughs> around well, the Europe. I think, yeah, I think, you know, in uh, in the U.S., we hear it's Cab Cab Franc, but in Europe, it right. does go by a, a lot of different names, actually, more than we we'll probably necessarily need to go over. But the main ones on the right bank, you can find it called Boucher or in the Loire Valley, Breton. In Italy's Veneto, Bordeaux or Cabernet Franc. So those are kind of some of the, I would say, maybe the four most often you hear. But we have some, a lot of the other ones listed in the blog for you. Is there any others you think we should go over, Val? No. I think I think those are the ones that I've heard the most of and I've not heard I've heard mostly the the Boucher and the Breton those are the only two and at first I was going oh caught nope that's Malbec but I like how they say, you said Cabernet Franc in the northern regions of Italy. So I want to be frank about the Franc because <laughs> nobody knows where any of the names come from. We kind of write that in our show notes. Does anyone know where the names come from? And I wrote, nope. No. 
At the same time, <laughs> there anyone? are as anyone, <laughs> anyone? Yeah, as, as with many of our grape gabs, there are always a few theories that are put forth as to the origin of our subject du jour. So there are tales of it coming from the Basque country. And it, remember, one th- Basque country involves Spain and France. It's that little region on the border in the Pyrenees, and it's it's got a long history. It's got its own culture. But of course, that would counter the production of Cabernet Franc-based wines in Bordeaux that were happening about the same time as in the 18th century. Yet a little bit prior to that, as in the 1600s, there is more lore. We love more lore, and we defer to a lot of lore when it comes to grape origins, again, because frankly, <laughs> who knows? But it speaks to Cabernet Franc as the vine of choice, planted by an abbot in Saint-Nicolas de Bourgoy, and this abbot's name was Breton, hence the alias that Steph mentioned earlier. And that could be why they still call Cab Franc this in these here parts of France known as the Loire, but even then, it could have been brought from the Bordeaux or the southern France area or over the Pyrenees from the Basque Spain or who knows. But between the Loire and the Bordeaux's right bank, as well as the Pessac Leignan in the left bank, this is what Oz Clark calls the original Cabernet. And it, he says if in his book, Wine Grapes, which I love this book. It's a little old, Oz Clark and Margaret Rand. But he says, this grape gets far more respect in the Loire. Don't you think, Steph? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, you're drinking it all the time. I mean, it, it is an important grape for the Loire Valley. But I do think it's the original Cabernet. We're going to give a cheers to that at the end. We totally are. And and I have to say, I started falling in love with it about eh, seven or eight years ago. I think somebody introduced me to writer's block at a restaurant that's no longer here in Colorado Springs. We used to go to the Craftwood Inn and I would order that. It's just such a great food wine. And I was like, why don't I drink more of this? And that's kind of when it got on my radar. Mm-hmm. And then when I started exploring the Colorado wineries, which by the way, we do Cab Franc well here and we'll talk about that as well. But you know, specifically in the Touraine, you know, we found these examples, this Chinon that I have in my glass. We have Bourgoy, San Nicolas de Bourgoy and the Samor Champigny in the BDX. Though, however, where it gets, I'm not going to say less respect, but, you know, we could say that it's not so much the featured grape. Cheval Blanc, as Steph mentioned, it does bring about a 60% Cab Franc in the wine and about 59% of its vineyards are planted with Cab Franc. But I also saw that Le Petit Cheval from the early 90s was pushing about 98% of the grape in the blend. I want to say 90, Mm -hmm. 91. And then in the late 90s, around 86%. That's quite a bit for the Bordeaux, for the BDX. Totally. And of course, ozone. Ozone is normally about 50%. And of course, it's rarely the focus, unlike the Loire. Yeah, I think that's a really good difference between the two regions that are known for Cabernet Franc, but use it differently, you know? So I think that's a good point to make there, Val. When we first start learning about wine, we always learn about Bordeaux being blends being so important where that you know look at napa cabs where they tend to do single varietal cabs they'll do a lot of comparison napa valley and then bordeaux and then the marriage of the napa and the whole thing but there is a producer in bordeaux i did dig up a little drinks business article by the name of mark helliar and he bought the Chateau Sivrac estate in Cote Bourg. I think he bought it in 2006. Well, it was a, quite a few years after he purchased this property that he realized he had, oh, about 35% or so of the vines were like Malbec. And then he found six rows of Cab Franc. So he didn't realize it when he bought the vineyard. So he's been making these single variety Malbecs in this Bordeaux region. But in 2014, he made a small amount of 100% Cab Franc Bordeaux from the Cote d'Ivoire. Ooh, that sounds like a cool hashtag W25 challenge. It does if you can find it, because I, I did a little poking around. I saw in the one article he made 300 liters. I saw another source that said he made 680 bottles, and I kind of did the math on that, and it <laughs> didn't quite add up. So I'm not sure how much he made, but then they were they were saying this was the first 100% Cab Franc in the Bordeaux, uh, but I think it was probably Cote d'Ivoire, because I did see some others that were listed in another resource as 100% Cab Franc wines. There was Trottevier. Le Bel, Pitre, Bel Assiste. There are some others who have trotted out some uh, Pure Cab Franc releases. I have not seen one. That does not mean they don't exist because Val doesn't typically buy Bordeaux. There, I said it. (laughs) Well, well, you know, some of our diehard listeners, I think they know that about you, Val. They know a lot of things about you now after all these 193 episodes. (laughs) I know, right? I know. And it's... 
I, I'm sorry, it's just too much. But in the northeastern reaches of Italy, it does have some interesting representations, I should say, or some interesting styles. And for many years, they actually mistook Cab Franc or Cab Franc for Carmen Air. So while they still call it Cabernet Franc, as in Frankie goes to Hollywood, as in relax, there are some rock star producers making some Cab Franc wines in Italy from the likes of Quinterelli in the Veneto. Schiopetto in Friuli Venezia Giulia and Ca del Bosco by Maurizio Zanella in the Sabino IGT of Lombardia. Now, I thought Ca del Bosco was all about the French Accord to Steph. I didn't know about this one. I don't know, but you know what? I love the Italian wines made from, you know, French grape varieties. Mm -hmm. And so that sounds very intriguing to me. Well, then you probably love you some super Tuscans, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, shout out to Tuscany, which Cabernet Franc does have a good-sized role in the production and the history of the Super Tuscan wines. So hello, Bulgarty and Steph. I have a question for you. Shoot. This is a one bourbon, one shard, one beer question for you. So if Kern and Stubb from that podcast were here, do you think they would reverse pair a Cab Franc with Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood or Frankie by Sister Sledge? This is fun. I love this music and wine pairing stuff. Okay, I would have to go with uh, Sister Sledge, Frankie. Yeah. I think so, too. It's like smoother. There's something about it that's like more wine sultriness or something more. I don't know. I like, I just feel that like the wine that I'm having here, this uh, Bordeaux that I'm having would go great with that song. And I think your dancing velvet Elvis yeah. would go with relax. Totally. Woo. So <laughs> there we go. We just ripped off their podcast. No, I'm kidding. We didn't. But it is a little nod to you guys because it does get me thinking about alcohol and music a little differently. So shout out to those guys. But what about all in the Frank, all in the Frank fam? What about all in the Frank fam, Steph? Who are the relatives of this grape? Well, without getting too too far deep into all of this, Cab Franc does have some relatives because Cabernet Sauvignon is an offspring of Cabernet Franc, and so are Merlot and Carmenere, and that is also why they have so many personality traits that are the same, right? There's a lot of characteristics that are the same about these grapes, and why they're also confused in other countries when people say, oh, I thought I, I thought those vines were Carmenere, you know, whether it's whether it's a French vigneron or somebody in uh, Chile, you know, it's easy to confuse them if you don't know. Yeah, I remember I think when Sharon McCarthy was on the show she was talking about how they had to mark the different vines because they were confusing the Carmen Air with I believe Merlot in Chile and then of course they confused the Carmen Air and a Cap Franc in northern Italy so mm -hmm. I mean they're all kind of like family and I was drinking a Carmen Air the other night and I can definitely see some of the similarities with the wines that I am drinking now so mm -hmm. definitely crossover. Yes. But we can find this grape so many places in the world, Steph. I mean, old world, new world, single varietal form, Meritage, other styles. Where can we find this grape outside yes. of the France and Italy and the South of South America that we're talking about here? Yeah, we'll just kind of condense it. You know, there's some great examples in Hungary, South Africa, places in New Zealand with some cooler climates, California, of course, and Washington State. I will mm -hmm. actually, for Justin's party on Monday, we're going to be serving a Washington State Cab Franc. And then also on the other side of the U.S., so on the eastern seaboard over there, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, those have some amazing examples. Yes, they sent us some. In fact, when this episode airs, Steph, it'll be exactly a year since we recorded the New York wine episode and we drank some killer Cab Francs from oh, the Finger yeah. Lakes. Yeah, good memories. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Oh, I know. It seems like it was forever ago, but we had so much fun drinking and learning about those New York wines. So good reminder. And then Canada also has some great examples like Hello, their ice wine made from Cab Franc. That is just mm -hmm. mind blowing. And then Colorado. As I mentioned earlier, we do some decent Cab Franc here in Colorado. So shout the hell out, Steph, because I found 
This is so crazy. I found a Colorado Cab Franc Against the World interview from earlier this year. And this is from our friend uh, Paul Bonacquisti. Chacha's in the house, too. I'm going to link up this episode. It's on Spreaker. I'm not sure if I can find it somewhere else. But for now, I have it on Spreaker. And they've got Michelle Cleveland of Creekside Cellars. And I guess her award-winning Cabernet Franc. Yeah, she's the winemaker there, right? She is the winemaker. So she makes some killer uh, Cabernet Franc. And she actually talks about why it grows so well in Colorado. Colorado in this podcast. So for those of you kind of like Colorado, that's right, Colorado. And so we'll link that up for you too, because that's kind of our signature grape variety here as far as reds go in this in this state, in this in the square state here. In the square state. I love that. Yeah. So that was uh, Denver Wine Radio's podcast. If mm-hmm. you guys don't remember us talking about them before. We also earlier this year when we did our Toraldigo Grape Gab talked about some award winning wine from Colorado. So As no surprise, we also have that information because there was a Cab Franc that was award winning this year too. So Book Cliff is one of those. And then Creekside Sellers, check them out too. So great examples. Yep. Let's move on to what's what does it taste like in the glass? You know, what is what is Cab Franc like, especially if it's a varietal wine, 100%. I want to focus on that because you're going to see it with it express itself differently. You know, if it's a sweet wine or a sparkling wine, or maybe it's a rosé like Val has, you're going to have different expressions. I just want to make sure that, you know, when you're really just talking about classic single varietal uh, Cab Franc wines, those are dry to medium bodied with a ruby color. The fruit focuses on like raspberries, red fruits, some black fruits like blackberries. And then there's great herbs earthiness like leather and tobacco could be pencil lead even and and then you like we've mentioned these floral aromatics that are beautiful and then the green vegetal flavor so think of celery seed or green pepper some of those notes the tannin and acidity are elevated but not as high as cabernet sauvignons it is a nicely tannic higher acidity wine but when you're comparing it to the ever so prominent Cabernet Sauvignon, there is a difference. And, you know, all of these different wines that we're talking about come at different price points. So you can have a really nice $17 bottle of Cab Franc, but then you can also have something sort of high-end $100 bottle. Or like the Cheval Blanc that we were talking about earlier, you know, that goes up to like $800 a bottle. So there is a very wide range of Cab Franc out there. That's what makes it fun to explore. As Steph was going through that, and by the way, you killed, I love all the aromas and the, the way you just kind of nailed the description of the wine. Thank you. And I can't keep my nose out of this, this 08. I'm like... St- when I say not hating, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> Dried raspberries. It's just, and you said pencil lead, you yeah. know. And when you go from that back into the rosé, then you go right back into, whoa, flowers, hey, yeah. you know, gardenia, <laughs> wow. Right. I think that was a great summary and an homage almost to Cabernet Franc stuff. Definitely. And we have, there's a lot more information out there and we do have our resources listed uh, for you guys like we do for these grape gabs. Please share any any great Cabernet Francs that you love or want to recommend. Uh, you can tweet us or you can put it in our Facebook community page, wherever. And let's move on. How about Wine or Radar? Yeah, Wine or Radar. And we're actually right now I'm working on a certification summit that we're doing in January on Australia. So Ooh. that'll be the last week in general, that is for uh, Society of Wine Educators members, but we're going to be talking about some really cool wines. And some of them I was, I mean, one of them in particular, I was not very familiar with. So I'm actually doing some research on that now. And I might even order some because I found a source that has it. And I'm just like, whoa, this is some crazy stuff. And I'm kind of working on, on that right now. And that's only, what, five weeks away. So yeah, that's that'll... crazy. What about you? Any, any wine or radar? Wine or radar. I did watch. I have a confession. Uh oh. I watched Psalm three. Why is that a confession? Well, because you didn't love it. I loved it. I can't say that I like it more than I liked Psalm two. I really liked the second movie a lot, so I would put it maybe about the same. I did love seeing uh, 
Jancis all over the movie. And actually, I really need to tweet her and ask her what brand of lipstick she wears because it never comes off her wine glass and she always has great lipstick. So (laughs) anyway... (laughs) Anyhow, I uh, was very entertained and I took some notes and and Justin watched it with me and he put up with me pausing and, you know, stopping and, you know, doing all my writing notes and and things like that. So I'm like, let's rewind because I missed that one little bit there. (laughs) So it was good. Very entertaining, worth watching over the holidays and, and sharing with your other wine geek friends. Should we move on to the pod quiz segment? This is so fun. I love how you started this pod quiz. I know. Well, I think somebody asked us to do pop quizzes. And so we were sitting there chatting last week with Michelle. And I was like, well, let's call it a pod quiz. It kind of like almost replaces a factoid, if you will. Yeah. If if you think about it. I mean, it wasn't the intention. It just kind of a natural evolution of things. But last week on the pod quiz, we asked about the Darnable PDO. D-A-R-N-I-B-O-L-E. Don't you guys love when I spell on this thing? So we asked, where is it? What kind of wine is it? And what kind of grapes are used to make it? And the answer is, the Darnable PDO is in England. I don't know if we mentioned it in our English sparkling. I think we talked about English sparkling wine. I don't know if we talked about all kinds of English right. wine in that episode. Right. We did an English wine episode. But the, this PDO in England only makes one kind of wine. It is a white wine and is made with the Bacchus grapes. Now, the grapes can only come from one winery and one vineyard that belongs to that one winery. And that winery is Cornwall County's Camel Valley. I know we talked about Camel Valley in that episode, or I think we at least mentioned it. And I think this is so unique stuff because there are other requirements too. We're going to tease enough so we'll make you want to read it because it does require a bit of reading. And I'm not going to read the whole article and plagiarize it here for you because the other requirements are that the wine has to be sealed under screw cap. Yeah, that's kind of mind blowing. I mean, that's like, whoa, that's a pretty new requirement not expected for sure not expected white grape screw cap bottle bacchus grape one winery one vineyard from that winery it's the only kind of wine that comes in that pdo and they can't use animal products so you know for fining sometimes they use like sturgeon bladders or they use egg whites or whatever so no animal products can be used in producing the wine Mm mm-hmm And the wine has to be dry. So it can't be sweetened. They can't use acidification techniques. They can't do any of that. And then there's the whole hand harvesting and the pressing and all that. And we'll let you read these tidbits in the Wine, Wit, and Wisdom blog because I am just obsessed with these crazy, off-the-wall, fringe-ass things that they come up with and and jane is like she's just like all over it and i know this is jane behind this i know it (laughs) is of course it's like it's like this rate her radar is it makes our wino radar look like i know you know yeah old technology so hey steph what do you think about that darnable po i think i want to try that that's for sure and i'm really impressed with how specific for you know it being such like english wine you know like still kind of coming on the scene and getting it feet wet, I think. And it's interesting that they put so many specifications on it. Right? Mm -hmm. And I I think I made a joke on Twitter or something and said, I want a t-shirt that says, ask me about the Darnable PDO. Yeah. Oh, you'll never forget it. I I don't know if it's Darnable or Darnable, but I just say Darnable. Um, (laughs) I speak the English, but that was last week's pod quiz. And we have one for this week. Stephanie, you ready? You ready? ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. We're bouncing in our chairs. We're so professional here. This week's pod quiz, since we're cab fronking it up, it made me think about the Loire Rosé wines. And of course, I have one in my glass here. So there are a few Cabernet-based Rosé wines made in the Loire. And just when someone told you that rosé wines from France are dry, Wine to Five is going to come along and ruin your day. Because Cabernet de Sommer and Cabernet d'Anjou can both be made with Cabernet Sauvignon and its grape daddy Cabernet Franc. But between the Cabernet Sommer and the Cabernet d'Anjou, which one is required by law to have at least 1% residual sugar and therefore made in a sweeter or off-dry style? That's the pot quiz. One of those two is sweeter than the other. Is it the Cabernet de Sommer or Cabernet d'Anjou? 
That's right. That is your pod quiz for the week. And I think last week I said, don't Google it. And then I said, no, go ahead and Google it because that's how you learn. You learn by doing research and participating in that cognitive activity Mm -hmm. that ties that information to something active in your brain. So definitely go ahead and tweet out your answers or let us know if you've got the answer. Some of you probably know you might be experts on Roses and the Loire, but that is the pod quiz for this week and we'll answer it next week. We may have mentioned something about it in our Loire episode. So if anybody dug any deeper after they listened to the Loire episode, they may have the answer already. Yeah. So we will go over that next episode. Now it's time for our shout outs. We're shouting out to a listener. Val, you want to read her great message? Yes, we received a message from Alicia in Oklahoma, and we want to thank her for reaching out to us. And she says, just wanted to say, I love your podcast. I don't have a lot of wine education in Oklahoma, so I love that I can listen to your podcast and learn more about this beautiful juice. Keep doing awesome things. And this was from about a month ago. Sorry, Alicia, we're just getting to it. But I love that you guys reach out and let us know what you love and why you love it. That's you right. know, if you're somewhere in a, I call it a wine desert, you know, where you're not getting a lot of uh, tastings or maybe your store doesn't have a lot of variety or you don't have a purveyor there. But I hope, as in most places, things come to you soon. And thank you for listening. In the meanwhile, we're glad we can be there for you. Yes. Another cheers to our show sponsor, Weekly Tasting and WTSO. And I have to say... These two wines that I'm drinking are from WTSO, you guys. Gorgeous wines, amazing prices. I won't go over the prices because I want you to go find them because it's fun to poke around and the deals are amazing and the wines, like I like the descriptions tell you, I mean, you could be drinking something that's like a dancing Elvis. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And the deals are like ridiculous. I mean, I saw one tweeted out today for the holidays. But to get in on that, you got to go to your listener page at weeklytasting.com slash W25. Some of you have already done that. Some of you already reaped the rewards. So sign up and get started or just go to our web page and click on those grapes. (laughs) And now (laughs) on to Patreon love, our Reserva Superiore supporter, Robin from Girls Gone Grape, our Reserva supporter, Auntie in Georgia, our Tenacious Tasters, Jeff E. from the award-winning We Like Drinking podcast, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, David and Lisa in Illinois, Anne-Marie in Virginia, Lynn of Savor the Harvest blog, and Sharon in Florida. And our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners, Megan, South Dakota, Clay in Arizona, John, Andrew, Iswani, and Kristen in California, Chantel in Ontario, Mary Lou in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Georgia, uh, Chris, Janet, and Diane in Colorado, Stephen, Renee in Illinois, Kathy in Tennessee, Sean in Ohio, Ashley and Sarah in North Carolina, and Michelle in Nevada. And our tastemaker listeners, David in Scotland, Carol in Kentucky, Karen in California, Chip and Katie in Pennsylvania, Serena in New York, Annie in Colorado, and Danielle. And you can go to wine25.com and click on support to show your support and find more details. And now it is that time for our monthly Patreon drawing. And Val has got... I'm setting it up. I'm setting up the the numbers in here in my randomizer. This is not gambling, by the way. This is not gambling. We don't gamble here on the show. Val and the randomizer. Watch out. Those two together. Okay. So I've put it in. I'm going to randomize. Ooh, that's kind of a purple. Is it uh, 161 is the number? Purple. 161. Clay J. Oh, Clay J. Clay J. Clay J. That's so funny. Clay J. has been on the show. Clay in that sick ride parked in his driveway. (laughs) Hey, hey, Clay J. Hey, Clay J. So, Clay J., since you are in AZ in Arizona, you are going to get some WTSO and weekly tasting swag. So, some cool stuff will be coming your way because WTSO is not shipping to Arizona. Not yet. Not today. That may change. But we will get you 
some great swag. So congratulations. Congratulations, Clay. And thank you so much for your support. And everybody, between our weekly episodes, you can find so many good goodies, so many good goodies on our website, windtofive.com. You can also find us in the social spaces at wine to five and Steph I believe this is our last episode before the holidays right this is the last episode for the holidays we should be cheersing to the original Cabernet the original Cabernet and if you celebrate Christmas Merry Christmas or whatever holiday season you celebrate thank you for listening we'll see you next week that's right Merry times and have a wine-tastic Christmas. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Cheers, Steph. Cheers. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine T-W-O 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips. We're cheersing all over the place here. (laughs)